A 17 or 18 year old kid during the Vietnam War uh, would board a jet airliner all by himself, be whisked away in 17, 18 hours, he would land in Saigon, be given some jungle equipment and taken out to a fire base or a base camp in the jungle somewhere and dropped off. At the end of the 12 month tour, he's loaded on a helicopter and he's extracted out of, a, out of the field and he's taken to Saigon, put on a jet, and like in my case, in 19 hours from being in an ambush in War Zone D, I landed in San Francisco and I was standing uh, in the airport with Vietnamese dirt on me still. And no one wanting to know about Vietnam and people walking by talking about buying the new BMWs, talking about uh, uh, going skiing at Big Bear. And uh, I had just spent two years in Asia and, uh, and, I, and my brothers were dying that evening in Vietnam and it set up a real icicle in my heart and I began to, began to isolate myself from society. I was taken out of a battle itself, put on a helicopter, and within 36 hours of leaving a battle and uh, shooting at people and all, all of a sudden I was back here in the United States and it's, it's really a big shock, it's unbelievable. You know, it's like one day you're, you're uh, supposed to be killing people and all, and then all of a sudden the next day, you know, or a couple of days afterwards, nothing, nothing. You, you know, you're expected to walk down the street, you know, be mellow and, and uh, act like a normal citizen. I pulled up the stool, said, shake the hand of another fool. I was there in 68, 69, and they ain't gonna bury me while I'm still living. Ain't gonna shut me up till my story's been told. Hey, I don't need no parades. I don't need But I ain't never been too sure If it was luck or the Lord I just know that somehow I survived In August of 1988, the moving Vietnam Memorial Wall visited Loveland, Colorado. This was an opportunity to speak with many individuals about the Vietnam veteran. These veterans, unlike those before them, live in the shadow of a less than complimentary public image. Listen now as a few Colorado vets and others present a personal portrayal of America's Vietnam veteran. You give a 19-year-old a means of destruction, you give, him, you give him the power of life and death, and that's a heady trip. That's a heady trip. No, I was a mess when I got back. Um, and that was because of some of my combat experiences. Um, but you can look it, and I did. Took a while. When I got back from Vietnam, I thought people were going to think it was, wow, man, you were in Nam. You know, you fought a war, you know, too much, you know. Uh, that didn't happen. Not that it bothered me, you know, it's no big deal. For the peace movement or those people in the peace movement to have, have um, um, condemned the soldiers in Vietnam was a big mistake and that, that, uh, that the, the returning soldiers should have been welcomed with open arms. When we came back, uh, the thing that I remember was a young lady that approached me in the airport, a very nice looking young lady who spit on me and started calling me baby killer, uh, drug fiend and all this other garbage. And uh, personally, I was not a drug fiend. When we came back, one of the most startling things that I ever ran into, I asked a girl out in California and she asked me if I'd ever been to Vietnam. And I said, yeah, and she says, no, she's not going out with any Vietnam vet. And that was after I got discharged honorably from the Navy, after doing two tours. So then she looked at me and she said, well, you know, what, what, what's, what's the matter? Can't you hear? And I said, no, ma'am. I said, I, uh, I lost most of my hearing. And the look she had was like, oh, you poor boy. And she said, how did you lose it? So I told her I lost it in Vietnam an ambush and the look on her face changed I mean just did a 180 like that and she looked at me and she said well you deserved it and turned around and walked away and I'm standing there going oh, 
hey, what did I do? You know, what did I do to you, you know? I just asked what the time was. For a long time, I suppressed some of the feelings that I'm, I had because of Vietnam, and my, particularly my reception back here. I felt that there was, that I was very different because I didn't no longer fit into what general society expected of veterans. By that time, polite society had stopped calling us names. They'd learned a little bit of tact, they just wouldn't talk to us at all. Forget it, it'll go away. Everybody forgets something. And um, you don't forget people, you don't. We feel that the healing process for Vietnam veterans really is encompassed in the people who didn't go for them to understand the Vietnam veteran and, and, and the war itself and why it was a different war than World War II or Korea. World War II was, was indeed the war that uh, changed the world and our fathers and our grandfathers were very proud of them. As a matter of fact, it was uh, their winning that war that inspired in us a sense of patriotism that uh, when our country called us to duty, we believed in that country, we believed in JFK and we went to do our duty. We had a country that was divided amongst itself. Uh, it's been noted that the Vietnam War is somewhat comparable in, in historical perspective as a civil war was. Uh, the Vietnam War to this century as a civil war was to the last century. Uh, the families being divided amongst themselves, guys leaving for Canada or just evading the draft or being drafted but the parents not supporting it, uh, various concepts of, of political points of view. I, I liked reading about the demonstration, you know, get out of Vietnam, U.S. out of Vietnam, because I didn't think we should be there either. But what, what got to me was uh, the people were actually down on the, the soldiers and as if, you know, we all chose to go there. You know, it's something you have to do when you turn 18. If you didn't go, you were considered yellow. You know, you weren't a patriot. You didn't love your country if you didn't go. I never would have been down on anybody because they happened to have to go fight a war. You know, why not blame the government? Um, what this country needs to recognize is that it's time to separate the war from the warrior. Don't blame us for that war. We didn't set the policies. There are other issues that are in, in the public now. The Agent Orange issue. The government sprayed the jungles out there so that we could fight a better war, and yet the veteran also got sprayed, and at this time, there are many veterans and members of their families who are suffering from this disease. Agent Orange was a, was a defoliant that was widely used in Vietnam. Uh, it was sprayed from aircraft and, and, um, and helicopters to uh, eliminate the forest cover that the uh, Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese forces uh, used to cover their activities. And uh, those uh, men who were involved in applying Agent Orange uh, in any stage of it were exposed to it. And uh, Agent Orange has a uh, deadly chemical uh, called dioxin in it that uh, causes both short-term and long-term medical problems for those who have been overly overexposed to it. There's a deeper issue, and one that I know is real unsettling to people, and that is, how do I, how do I know if I got it? You know, the Center for Disease Control can't tell you what it is. I mean, even if we were very well-intentioned and we wanted everybody to, to be service-connected for it, who should be, then how do we know what criteria to establish? And nobody does. Um, that kind of works on your mind sometimes. Uh, I don't know anybody that wasn't at least around it. You drank it, you ate it, you wallowed in it. Some guys get it and some guys don't, and then you think, geez, what's going on here? Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't allow you to, to kind of close off that chapter is one of the things. We feel like that they have a liability because of spraying us with the cancer-causing chemical, just like a corporation or a company would to their employees. And they keep ducking on this issue too, and this is not right, this is not just, there's no way to treat a warrior. And it's up to all of us to take care of these men. You know, if you give a leg up for your country, you don't feel like you gotta go and argue with somebody about, should I give you a benefit? That's not even an issue for us, and that, that's hard for people sometimes to understand. We did what we had to do, and we did it honorably, okay? Uh, and we got screwed in the process. I mean, we got screwed real bad. We've got a far too many veterans have 
uh, committed suicide. There's a, what, there's a very disproportionate rate of uh, marital problems, drinking problems, drug problems, incarceration. These things are all related to the post-traumatic stress disorder. We have to deal with this, and there are means of dealing with it, but uh, we find that the service agencies, such as the, the Veterans Administration, are insensitive to what really needs to be done here. The wives and the families of Vietnam veterans also have uh, symptoms of what's called post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and they seem to have gotten that by living with uh, veterans over a long period of time. It seemed, they seem to get it by osmosis. Part of the problem is I don't think this country realizes the tremendous amount of time that you obligate yourself to care for veterans and their family members, okay? Just quick example, there are still 20 recipients of Civil War pensions as wives and as children, okay? Now the Civil War was what, 125 years ago? Um, war costs you for a long time and it's, wars are so easy to slide into. 10 years from the day I left the service, my GI Bill education benefits disappeared. If Uncle Sam sends me over and lets people shoot at me for a while, I figure he owes me an education no matter how long it takes for me to get my head back together. There's sort of an obligation. It's the obligation that we felt as veterans in order to go. Uh, but there's an obligation on the part of the nation to care for the wives, the widows, the children, the men themselves who fought that war. I think uh, America has forgotten a basic point that Vietnam was an American history, not just a veteran history. Uh, the politicians are the ones that uh, decided it was time for us to go over there and help and uh, go to war. And it was the politicians ultimately that sold out the country and sold out uh, Vietnam and sold out the veteran. For over 15 years now, we've had to walk around like this, no more. That's why I wear my jacket, I wear my ribbons, and I wear everything proudly because I earned every damn one of them. The camouflage fatigue is still hanging in a lot of people's minds. That's what Vietnam vets are all about. That's what the media portrays. And that a lot of Vietnam vets are hurting guys. A lot of them are not. The American public saw Walter Cronkite on, uh, on the news every night at 6 o'clock for the whole war. And they were, the American public was really fed up with hearing about Vietnam every day. So by the time we came home, we had no one to talk to, and no one wanted to hear it. I have a son, a stepson, that the only way that he knows anything about war is watching the movies, and it's totally wrong. He watches Rambo and Chuck Norris. Well, these are exciting, but he doesn't know the terror and the heartbreak and the tears that go along with being in combat. And God help him. God help these kids, these uh, 10, 11 year old kids running around here in, in camouflage and one thing or if they ever have to go into combat. I think the one thing that the American people can do and should do is to realize that the image that Hollywood has betrayed of us is false. We are not Rambos, we are not killers. Many of us have gotten back into life. We have some problems from the war and we need your support, your concern, and compassion. Most of the stuff that I think I've seen that come to my mind immediately, and I've got several pictures in my head right now, that they're all showing Vietnam vets in a stressful situation, hurting something, or about to hurt, or they're hurting so bad that they're reacting out, and they're picked up immediately. But it was media's perception uh, of the way that we were, and there are a number of guys who came back who after a period of time said, hey, maybe we are that way. I think the media gives us a lot of sensationalism over it, and I think really the people are getting a little bit sick of it. The media needs to focus more on what good the Vietnam veterans do. The majority of the guys are doing fine. They're handling it real well, and they're doing some really neat jobs, and they're, they're doing phenomenal things in the community. It's just that the good news a lot of times never gets published, no matter who you are. There is a special uh, camaraderie, there's a special wisdom, there's a unique wisdom that the veterans have, which no one else has because of virtue of the experience. The Vietnam veteran today can do something to keep our children from having to fight in a needless conflict like this again without full support of the country or the government. The Vietnam veteran has something valuable to give to our society. They have something to tell our children, to tell our future children. 
they have something to add instead of subtract. We're a very positive force as we're seeing the World War II veterans and the Korean War veterans begin to fade. We are going to be the driving force among veterans in our country. And by being able to speak out about a lot of issues that concern us, namely the Agent Orange, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and support in a war situation, we can hopefully stop something before it ever starts. Three years ago, we had very factual information. We had photographs, we had map locations of my brother and 18 other men being held prisoner in Southeast Asia. This information was given to our government and it was taken by Senator De Consini to Vietnam. Three years later, we still have no comment from our government or from Vietnam. Our men are alive over there. And we need your help in getting them back. We've had servicemen who have been missing in action, who our government knows who they are, where they're being held, who's holding them, and they haven't been allowed to come home, and our government hasn't done anything about it. They've written them off. And that's why I'm involved in this issue. This affects everyone in our country as a whole, not just family members. We've got to get all those people accounted for and brought home and so we know what's going on with each and every individual and that uh, they need to be here. That's, that's the biggest issue of all. The Vietnamese have been saying for quite a few years now, we don't have any POWs, but something that needs to be understood, the Vietnamese said that when the French were at war with them, they said for years and years, we don't have any live POWs, we don't have any live POWs, and after all, I think it was like 16 years, out marched all these live POWs. Now I give credence to the possibility MIA still exists but I can't prove it, and I don't know how to prove it. Frankly, I have more respect for my enemy than to think he's gonna keep somebody there for 20 years in a cage. I know if they would've kept me in a cage and told me fix equipment, they'd have been out of business. Um, so I don't know. You know, here again, that's, that's a real emotional issue, and everybody's got their own mind made up. What's at hand now is for us to get answers from Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam about the over 2,000 men who are missing and never been accounted for. We'd like to know if they're dead. We'd like to know if they're alive, if they want to come home or if they don't want to come home. This issue affects all of us as a nation. I have a son who's three years old and someday he may be asked to serve. And while I'd be very proud to have him go and serve my country, if he goes missing, my country better account for him or do their best by him. We feel like that uh, uh, as far too many years have gone past to have this uh, 2,400 Americans unaccounted for, we find that unacceptable. We know that there are answers to these questions and we feel like that uh, our government's hedging and the Hanoi government's hedging and we're trying to rally support for this cause and put enough pressure on them to make them resolve it and put an end to this thing that really is probably the primary reason that it's so difficult for us to, to put the war down. Oh, there's a lot of things that you can do. You can pray, you can write your congressman and your president and your senators and ask them what they are actively doing now on this issue, not what they've done in the past, what they're doing now to bring our POWs home. They can write letters to the editor. You don't have to be an expert on the issue to express a thought. Let's get our boys back, all of them. And let's get them back now. Where are they? If your child was missing, you'd want to know. I want to know. Start asking questions, start getting active, because the next war is not going to be very pretty. And I don't want your son to die in it any more than I want my son to die in it. It's flat terror all the way around. And you can't go through nine months of being scared every day of your life, seven days a week, without some scar showing up in there somewhere. As long as people learn to understand that uh, to an extent, what it was that we went through, what it is that we've been going through, uh, and that's all we asked for. I get asked a lot of questions by the young kids, you know, what, uh, um, what went on in Vietnam and all this, you know, which only goes to show me that uh, these kids are just, they're crying for answers and nobody's talking to them. Nobody's talking to them. The uh, Vietnam veteran is seeing a turnabout because more and more people are asking questions because history books don't treat the Vietnam War like they should. They don't answer a lot of questions and they don't ask a lot of questions. 
So that's why we're out here walking around. If somebody stops and says, what was it like? We'll tell them straight out without any qualms. We'll tell them what it was like to get shot at. We'll tell them what it was like to see our friends die. We'll tell them what it was like to survive and the struggle with that after we came home. There needs to be more of an education uh, historically of the Vietnam War. And I believe that, that once that begins to happen, there will be more empathy with the Vietnam veterans and the veterans will begin to open up to the citizens of this country. I think the vets have to get out and talk about it. They have to get it out of their system and, and, and verbalize the th that cancer that is inside them, you know, the, the, the torment. It took a long time to insulate, to cover up. Sometimes it takes a long time to peel all that insulation off. To, uh, kind of peeling the onion, learning all the different layers, all the different stories, all the different memories that you stuff down to different parts of your mind. Dealing with the stuff that comes up, you don't want to do it too fast, you don't want to do it too slow, you just want to get it done. These guys can be helped, and, uh, but not without help from everybody else. And I think that's what we have to understand here. Ultimately, I suppose that the individuals have to deal with it themselves, and what we're doing, there's no better way to do it than, than vets taking care of vets. It takes one Vietnam veteran to sit down for another Vietnam veteran to tell him about it, because he's talking to understanding and listening ears. With the vet centers, the, the outreach programs, at America, or the American GI Forum, the Disabled American Veterans Vietnam Vet Outreach Program, started up back in 78, those programs have helped vets realize that vets can help vets, and I think they've started to recognize that. But there are a lot of guys out there that, that, that won't, that blow it off and say, hey, I don't need help, okay, because they've had to go alone for so long that uh, they're afraid to open up, okay. So they just go along saying, hey, I'm okay, and they're not. Uh, and these are the guys that I think need the help most. It starts really with the process of wanting to be better. Okay, that may sound silly, but you've got to want to be better. You've, in some cases, got to have some professional help. And uh, a lot of it is the symptoms resolve themselves somewhat over a period of time as well. Get involved. If you're a veteran and you're out there and you're hiding and you haven't faced it yet, get involved, come out. Find some organization, the DAV, Outreach, uh, Vet Centers, any type of Vets organization, we'll help you. One of the things that happened to us from Vietnam is that we never did get together. We went over as individuals and we came home as individuals. What Vietnam Veterans of America is all about is trying to get all Vietnam veterans together so that we know who each other are and that we can uh, form our different associations and relationships together and that uh, we can finally, 20 years after the war, come together as a group. I'd like to remind everyone that there were a lot of women who served over there as well as nurses. And they went through, in some cases, a worse hell than the guys have been. To label somebody because of a, of, a, of a hurtful experience in one person's life that another person now has to be a certain thing or a certain way, it's unfair to both parties. We need the support of the of the uh, public. I'm, I'm tickled to death to see this kind of support going on out here. I, I just blows me away. I never thought. Eight months ago, like I said, when this whole thing started getting put together, I never thought that it would be this kind of a, a show up. My brother went over there in July of 1964. We were sitting at the kitchen table on his last leave home and we were talking and, and, and he was talking about his, the LERPS team and how proud he was of them all. And he got real serious and he looked at my mom and he said, Mom, I, I'm going to come home whole. He said, if anything happens, you got to bring me home no matter what. I have to come home. And she looked at him and none of us knew. You know, and she says, yeah, I'll bring you home. And he said, promise. And he reached across. And she promised him. And I never correlated the POWs and MIAs to that simple statement and it wasn't simple but I wonder how many of those boys asked their moms to bring them home and they can't they can't do anything I try to put my mom in, in the position of some of these mothers my mom would be insane she would be so full of guilt 
I'm so glad my brother got to come home even though he's dead. At least I know he's home and I know where. I don't have to wonder. Kairos, Franklin A. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Carlock, Ralph L. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Carlson, John W. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Carlson, Paul V. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Carlton, James E. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Carpenter, Howard B. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Brownlee, Robert W. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Brush, Donald W. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Brusher, John M. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Brunson, Jack W. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Butcher, Bernard L. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Buck, Arthur C. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Buckley, Lewis. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Buckley, Victor. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Buell, Kenneth R. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Bullard, William H. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Burke, William C. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Bullock, Larry A. Not present, not accounted for, sir. Bundy, Norman L. Not present, not accounted for, sir.